So I am here with Mr. Eric Tyke Miller from YouTube. That's where I've discovered you uh, from uh, Twitter. Sorry, from Twitter, not YouTube, from Twitter fame. <laughs> and I do want to say, first of all, say thank you for not only joining the podcast today and being the first guest, which is really exciting, but also you've done something on Twitter that you don't really see much is like a positive photography community where it's not about the the camera it's not sony versus canon versus nikon or jpeg versus raw you're all about like promoting just people taking pictures and sharing pictures and that's awesome like that is such a a refreshing thing to see on twitter so thank you for doing that that is amazing you're very welcome i appreciate it so what what got you into photography because you haven't been doing it long from what i saw on your website I, I haven't. So um, I, I started photography about a year ago. It's probably been a little bit over a year ago. It was March of 2021. Um, and like growing up, I've always kind of wanted to do something creative in some way. I mean, I grew up around musicians for the most part. My mom was a singer. My dad's a drummer. Um, so I always had something creative going on around me at all times. Mm -hmm. um, Sad to say, I can't carry a tune, don't really have much rhythm, so music wasn't really going to be an option for me. Mm -hmm. um, I tried writing a little bit, which I still do from time to time, but nothing really clicked for me until I decided to pick up a camera, um, and that happened last year um, uh, as, as things were to align. Um, I, I kind of picked it up for a different reason, honestly. Um, my initial goal with a camera was to do um, YouTube videos, actually. Okay. Um, I was going to do uh, YouTube videos around um, IT um, and cybersecurity because that's what I do during the day um, and just do educational content to try and, you know, just educate people in the community about best practices and things like that. Yeah. Um, and my first week with the camera, I decided to take it out just to play around with it, get to know it learn yep. all the features and all that good stuff with it um, and decided to take out my girlfriend one afternoon and uh, played around with it downtown for a little while and just kind of fell in love with photography um, after spending some time with it, uh, trying around with some, you know, trying out some editing and yep. just seeing what I could do with it. And I just never put it down after that. And here we are today. So that's how it happened. <laughs> Having you said your parents are creative people. What was that like? like? How has that influenced your creativity, having two other people who are creative and know that creative process of trying to build something, creating something, the setbacks and all that, all that stuff? Yeah, I mean, it, it was definitely a big part of it. Um, but as far as the creative process, I wasn't as exposed to it as I would have liked um, back okay. then because my mom, as a singer, she mostly sang in like clubs or bars, which was whichever band that she was a part of. She okay. was never a commercial singer. So I never really got exposed to the creative side of it until much later on. Um, my dad does uh, like video recording or not video recording, but music recording. He has a little studio that he does recording out of. Um, and so seeing that was really the first time that I really became attached to the creative process just seeing the recording happen and the editing that he did um, after the fact, all the post-processing work that I had to go into it, that process is really what I fell in love with when it comes to creativity, just turning something that is raw and mm -hmm. uncut into something that is like a piece of art. And that's kind of how I ended up approaching photography as well. Um, I'm very much someone that is not like married to the idea of photography itself being something that's pure and and you know what you get in camera is what it's supposed yeah. to be or i'm also strangely enough not someone that is super big into photography as a as a way of capturing a moment or a memory that's yeah. not kind of where i approach photography from i approach photography from seeing an object that's out of place or seeing um, a subject that I find interesting or um, seeing a scene that's that's really pretty or cool and capturing it. But I don't think of like 
what it is in front of me that yep. is the final product, I see that as the starting point. So I make sure that I capture as much data in that image as I can, make sure the exposure is right, all the technical stuff um, with taking the camera, make sure I got the proper depth of field, make sure everything that I want is sharp. And then from there, my what I'm thinking of when I'm capturing it is what am I going to do once I get this into post-processing? Yeah. Do I want to, you know, am I make am I capturing this as a black and white? Am I capturing this to set a mood? Am I capturing this to um, any number of things? Like I'm thinking of the end result instead of just what I'm looking at. Um, so you're I'm talking about images. post-processing. What what software do you use uh, to do that? So I use probably about 90, 95% of the time I'm using Lightroom. Okay. Um, I don't do a whole lot of work in Photoshop. Um, every now and then I might use spot removal tool in Photoshop just because yep. it's a little bit more reliable than the healing yeah. tool in Lightroom. Um, but I don't really do much um, like alteration to photos. I primarily just work with colors and maybe do a little bit of sharpening here and there and maybe add a little bit of texture. Um, but then I'm, I'm, I really just like to play with color theory. I absolutely nerd out in color theory. Um, yeah. If, if, if it's something that someone's talking about and it's related to color theory, I'm there. <laughs> I go down <laughs> rabbit holes on YouTube all the time. Um, but that's the part that I really enjoy is just making sure that it is well balanced, all the colors mesh well. And then I'm just left with something that is appealing to my aesthetic, honestly. And if other people like it, awesome. <laughs> What, what got you into like color theory and, and really focusing on color and photography? Because that's really interesting you say that because I'm someone who I really haven't gone down that route. Like I'm more, I wouldn't say traditional, but like what I see yeah. in the camera is kind of, I enhance that. But right. looking at your pictures, I was blown away. I was like, this is, I've never <laughs> looked at the, like a picture of looking the way it looked with what you've done. Well, so whenever I am working in post-processing, um, typically what I am aiming for isn't necessarily enhancing what's already there, but I have an image of what I want it to look like in my head. Okay. Um, and so I'll typically like darken areas here and there, and then just move that kind of, you know, move it around until I get the, what, what I find appealing in the image. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm aiming for the mood or the feeling that I want the image to okay. Um, to excite within me. And then if other people you know, feel the same thing, then I did my job, but really I'm, I'm doing it for myself. Um, <laughs> but it, it really just comes down to the way I look at photography. Um, I've always been someone that believes that photography, uh, at least to me, because how people look at photography is going to be different for everyone. And yep. I respect that across the board. But for me, it's, it's really a starting point. It's, it's like a canvas. Um, I've got a lot of photos that look very painterly in the end with, after I'm done editing them. But I, I just really move things around until I've got the balance that I'm looking for and the mood that I'm looking for. And when it comes to like diving into things like color theory and contrast and exposure, I'm just the type of person that if I find something I enjoy and that I'm passionate about, I will hyper-focus and yep. just go down a learning rabbit hole all the time. Like in all of my spare time, you'll, you can find me like watching YouTube videos, reading through articles about anything related to what I'm interested in. Um, so and I'm a very technical person too. So I also learn as much as I can about the mechanics of the camera, the science okay. behind lenses, and just everything I can absorb about it. So that's kind of where I get to color theory from. I, I love to just play with the idea and see what I can do with it. There's a photographer um, or the host of This Week in Photography. Years ago, he used to say, pixels are meant to be punished, where he would <laughs> go in there and like mess with as much as he can. In light, like he used Lightroom. And then like you, he was like, Lightroom is the army and Photoshop is the infantry. So when I need like a specific... Yes. I need to go do this. I'll go into Photoshop, do that one thing. Like you, right. I will go in and use the healing tool because it's better than what's in Lightroom versus uh, doing all my work in Photoshop. When 
I saw that you, you know, had just picked up. I was so surprised. You'd only not even a year, like just a year for photography. And you said you had a creative like crisis. What was that? Right. What was that like? Like, what what was that that made you say, like, I need to do something? I don't know <laughs> what yet, but I need yeah. to do something. So it, I, I've it, since I've been in my 30s, I've kind of had, I'm sure that many people go through this. <laughs> I wouldn't necessarily call it like a midlife crisis per se, but I've definitely become a lot more introspective with the way mm-hmm. I think about my life in general, where, the direction it's going and kind of what, where I want to be in life more yep. or less. And um, I got into IT primarily because it was something that came easy to me and I already had family that was into it. And I saw it as a means to an end. It mm-hmm. was really just a means to, excuse me, it was really just a means to a paycheck at the time when I picked it up. It was never something that I was super passionate in. It was just something that I could do and I picked up on. Um, So the only reason why I've gone so far into IT is because it became comfortable. It became Mm -hmm. something that I was making a decent paycheck on and it gave me the stability I needed um, just in my personal life to do, you know, make sure I could pay my bills on time, be independent financially. And that's the main reason I stuck with it this far but I always knew that it wasn't what I wanted to do as, um, you know, uh, as a passion. It wasn't something that I would do in my spare time. Like a lot of people that worked in the industry with me, they would go home and build a cup, like a server farm at home or build out a new storage array in their basement or uh, play with the new flavor of Linux. And I never did that. I would go home and, Um, maybe write a poem or write a short story or write something that was, um, you know, that I found interesting at the time or Mm -hmm. go on a a philosophical rant or something. I always wanted to do something creative in my free time. Um, So that's kind of what tipped me over into actively searching for something and just seeking it out so heavily Mm -hmm was when I got into my 30s, I started making a lot of other life changes. Like I started focusing on things like mental health. I started focusing on my finances and really just focusing in on the things I needed to focus in on to lead a more fulfilling life. Um, and then the, you know, the whole subject of passions came up and I was on a journey to find that thing. Um, Mm -hmm. At first, I thought it was going to be teaching, which is why I decided to start up a YouTube video around the things I knew, which at the time was IT. Um, And that's kind of where it started. And then when I started playing with the uh, camera, I found out that I actually had more of a passion for photography. And I still plan to do YouTube. I'll still do it. Yeah, I was going to say, I I highly encourage you to keep doing YouTube. It's it's fun. I I will. I will. Uh, I got to have free time for it. (laughs) Yeah. I'm kind of at this state of mind where I want to get photography to the point where I am comfortable enough and knowledgeable enough in it that I can talk to it and be confident that what I am talking to um, is uh, not just correct, but um, I I need the confidence in it to to, to really drive it home and and, uh, educate in a way that's impactful and gets the point across and people actually feel like they've learned something when they walk away. Um, it's funny you like say I'm, that because I've been doing this since 2009 and I still feel like that. I get on there, I'm like, oh man, the people are going to like, am I going to be able to say, come across with this passion of what right. I think I know? Like, does it come across right. that way? Like the imposter syndrome, I think that's yeah. really yeah. what and it I'll, is. And that'll plague us forever. Like, yeah. That's not something <laughs> that it, I think as humans in general, like I'm sure it's not just a creative thing, but imposter syndrome is real for everyone so at this point I really just need to start it and make time to start it um you know once I uh, feel comfortable enough to start you know writing through some subjects to talk about getting a few outlines done and then just you know dive into my first video um but I do have a lot of things going on in my personal life right now where I don't have a lot of free time to spread out to another creative venture uh, so at the moment, I'm, I'm, I'm personally struggling just to keep up with uh, the Twitter community and keeping everything engaging there. And um, I barely make time for photography right now. 
um, because I've got uh, a house that we're currently renovating. I'm currently living in a small apartment, so I don't really have a lot of room. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, my day job takes up a lot of my time. So I 100% understand because we moved from Denver to Seattle. We had a house. I had what I called mega studio in the basement. I had like a big Very monitor cool. and all this stuff. And now we live in an apartment where I don't have like I'm a, a, a nomad in my own home. I'm in my kids' <laughs> bedroom, like recording this. Uh, yeah. So I 100% understand like oh, yeah. needing to spread out and not having a lot of space. But you said you were a, a someone who was like, into writing. So how come when you were looking for this creative outlet, why wasn't right? What, what made photography stick when you already had like this outlet of writing? Well, so writing to me was a great outlet when I was going through some rough times back in you know, late, you know, mid to late high school times, I mean, a little bit afterwards, just as like an outlet to get feelings on paper, Mm -hmm. but it never really clicked for me as something that I could pursue as a career. Like it it never hit that threshold of something that I am passionate about to, you know, make a life out of. Um, I, I still enjoy writing. It's still something that I will definitely incorporate and it will always be incorporated into especially YouTube, you know, yep. trying to write out a script or just write down ideas. Um, but it just never clicked like photography did, honestly. That's the okay. What, I mean, you since you've been so, you're, you know, you're kind of at the beginning of this journey, what did you, were you taking pictures with your phone before? Like a lot of pictures with your phone or was this really a, uh, uh, you know, I'm going to try something new by accident. Like you kind of, you said you kind of got into it by accident. And then once you started clicking, it's like, oh, this is, you went down that rabbit hole. Um, it was honestly just that. I mean, I, I picked up the camera and decided to play around with it and just fell in love with it. Like before that, I never really took a lot of pictures on my phone. Um, I still don't, honestly. Like I will in a pinch use mm-hmm. my phone but just the feel and the way I can manipulate um you know like how I'm capturing an image within the camera is yep. just so much more intuitive excuse me than using a camera with a camera you're always going to have the auto um you know focus and then as yep. far as the depth of field it just seems so artificial to me um in most cases so I just don't feel the same weight when I'm using a phone than when I'm using a camera. Um, So, and again, I don't really take pictures just to take pictures. I I only take pictures of something that I find interesting or that seems out of place to me um, that I could turn into something either artistic or um, just enhance it to make it look even more gorgeous than the way I saw it with my eye or even instead of what I'm seeing, the feeling I felt when I was in the moment. That um, makes I sense. I to capture pretty often, yeah. So you've never done like uh, like weddings or kid family pictures or anything like that. You've always gone on the artistic, fine art side of your photography. Right, yeah, up to this point, I have not done anything that I would call commercial okay. uh, photography um, in any way. The closest I've gotten to I mean, no one even really call it commercial, but I do have a gallery currently in a commercial building that was uh, nice. cura- that was curated. Uh, nothing out on social media officially for that yet. So this, I guess, this is the first announcement. That's awesome. Um, That's really cool. But it, it it kind of came into fruition at the end of last year, and they haven't really gotten any uh, good pictures of the installation yet. I've gotten one that was right after installation. There's still like um, drywall dust on the floor in front of yeah. it. So it's nothing that looks great. So I'm waiting until they get me some, uh, their marketing team's actually able to get some proper photos of the installation. And then I've also been seeking permission to uh, tag the uh, company that it was uh, curated for and and all that good stuff in, in a post. But nice. that was really my first time doing something that I felt was on the professional level. Yeah, um, if, if you want to call it that. But um, honestly, I, I don't want to go down a path in photography where it feels like I am just catering to a client or catering to a company um, yeah. that I'm working for, um, because the 
fun I have out of it is the creative process and appealing yes. to what I find aesthetically pleasing. And I am finding some joy in trying to curate some photos in a way that, you know, is more appealing to a broader audience, mm-hmm. but it's still catering to my aesthetics to some level. Um, and I have full creative control over it. Um, I feel like if I start throwing in, you know, the commercialization of it, I'm not going to find as much joy out of it. So if, if I am going to do something with it full time, eventually, I definitely want it to be centered around my fine art photography, maybe selling prints um, and around the community and what I'm doing on Twitter and eventually YouTube. I'd much prefer it to be community focused and around my creative work yep. than doing, you know, going out to shoots every day or, you know, just doing the commercial rigmarole around uh, my creative work. I just don't. I like 100% to- understand because I, one of the things like I, I was, one of my YouTube videos was like, I'm no longer a professional photographer because I felt that same way where I was doing all this work for like companies or I did some like wedding stuff and I felt so drained that I didn't even want to pick up a camera for like my own my own pleasure. And I was like, I don't want to do that anymore. So I, I quit all the client work except for one. And I've just done, been doing my own work. So I completely 100% understand uh, how you feel with that. But saying on that route, we all like, have creative block. We all have mm-hmm. like this period of like, everything I shoot sucks. Ooh, there's something really cool. How have you been able to like push past some of the, like, we're all going to go through it, but how have you pushed right. through it? When well, you have been in that stretch. Yeah, and, and I've definitely had moments, especially recently with my lack of free time and yep. to, to be able to dedicate to it. I haven't been editing as much as I would like to, and I haven't been able to shoot as much as I like to recently. And you know, it some of it's time constraints, but other other parts of it is just having motivation to do it. Yeah. Um, because uh, you know, once I'm done with my day and once I'm done working on the house and all that stuff, I don't have a lot of motivation left over. Um, but typically the way I push through it is just to do it. Um, a lot of people say that they, you know, just simply don't have the motivation to, or they're waiting on the motivation to do it. (laughs) And more times than not, I've found that if you're waiting on motivation, it's not going to just come out of nowhere. Um, Sometimes you have to kind of just do the task and then build a momentum behind it to really get it going again and, and finding that motivation. And then hopefully if, if you stick to it and can keep doing it again, you'll it'll kind of snowball and you'll find that inspiration again. Um, but along with that, I honestly get a lot of inspiration from Twitter as well. Like since I've been on Twitter, um, it's been an awesome source of just amazing photographers that are out there, you know, yourself included. And all the people that are part of the threads that I do on a daily basis are just an endless supply of inspiration. And I've been fortunate enough not to get into the headspace of like comparing my work to other people's work, Mm -hmm. because that can be just like the opposite of what you need out of Yes. And instead of getting inspiration from it, you get envy and jealousy out of it and a whole bunch of other negative feelings. And I've been fortunate enough that I don't, harp on anything like that when I'm viewing other people's work uh, because whenever I'm pushing out work I, I don't I'm not very hard on myself yep. like I am a perfectionist I, I do often make more changes after I think I'm done with a photo but I, I'm very good about not comparing my work to others and also not feeling like something's never going to be finished yeah. Like if I get a piece to a point that I am at least comfortable with, yep. I'm okay sharing it. And I'm okay, like I, I'm at least confident enough to say that this stands on its own at this point. Um, and you know, I'll sometimes go back and re-edit, but yep. typically it's just small incremental changes after that. Um, so, but yeah, Twitter and just powering through it. So speaking of uh, Twitter, one thing that I saw that you said that you've always supported um, artists, you know, buying CDs and T-shirts. And I see that on Twitter with the same, like you're retweeting people, you're encouraging people to share their pictures. What mm-hmm. motivates, like, what is that motivation to 
support and like really again you're not pushing gear you're not talking about like uh jpeg versus raw it's really like hey show me your pictures i'll retweet as many as i can where does that motivation come from because it's so cool and like so rare i feel that you see that on twitter i hate yeah i I hate to think that it's rare but you're you're not entirely wrong um the, the first time i was really exposed to this kind of community was really when i shifted from an Instagram focus to a Twitter focus uh, and near the beginning of last year, well, not quite the beginning, I think it was a month or two after I really started into photography around mm-hmm. June or July, I think. Okay. Um, before that time period, my Twitter account was simply used maybe once or twice in the past. And I honestly created my Twitter account originally to keep track of server notifications for a game oh, wow. <laughs> play online. Um, so that was really the only use my Twitter account got until last year. Um, and only had like maybe one follower at the time. And I think it was a bot <laughs> um, or might've been a friend or relative, I don't remember. Mm-hmm. Um, but when I entered back into Twitter, it was after Instagram made that announcement where they were no longer um, just a photography app anymore. Yeah. Um, they were ch- kind of venturing into video and pushing reels. And you could tell that just still images no longer had the same weight there like yeah. they did before because they're trying to be another TikTok. Um, so I kind of made that shift and refocused my social media efforts into Twitter. And then shortly after I started seeing other people, um, you know, before me doing threads like I do. Yep. Um, uh, one, you know, a couple of them that comes to mind is uh, Junaid. Um, you've probably seen his threads if you've been a part of any others. Um, also, Braid, uh, Braden um, was another one that was around when I started. He, he and I actually started around the same time. Okay. Um, and then Costa, you know, Dan Costa, He's another okay. one that kind of started around the same time uh, that I did, but it started with um, Junaid on Twitter. Um, he was one of the first ones that I saw doing the photo threads, kind of encouraging people to connect with other photographers, encouraging people to share their work. Um, and it's just was a positive piece of the puzzle to kind of push me forward like you never want to rely solely on external validation but yep. as we all know external validation gives you that serotonin kick <laughs> you really need to keep some motivation here and there yep. until the you know it, it, your internal validation only gets you so far so yeah some external validation it, it's, it's great it's a good <laughs> motivator um so after being a part of those and seeing the growth that i got out of it um and sharing my images back then i immediately knew that I wanted to pay it forward. Um, So as soon as I felt like I had at least some following, I started doing the same kind of photography threads, but I did a little bit of a different spin on it um, because just having people share their photos, I like Junaid is, is great. Like he's an awesome guy, but every time I was in those threads, it just felt like everyone is coming there just to get retweets. Yep. And it just felt like a retweet machine. Yep. And I never wanted my threads to feel like that. I know that sometimes they probably do to some people from the out, looking from the outside in, but I really wanted to focus on um, community engagement and yep. re- real like um, organic support, which is why I try to be um, active in the um, photo threads. Yeah. I try to joke around with people. I try to make sure that I'm being, that I'm engaged in it. Now, to be fair, my day job might suffer a little bit, <laughs> that. but I, 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 it's worth it to me because it further encourages that kind of organic growth, not just in the community, but in the people in the community. Because anytime you get like real engagement from the community that you're a part of, yeah. um, it encourages you to do the same. Yes. Um, so the more I can encourage that, the more self-sustaining the community can become. And my hope is that once, you know, the community gets so large that I can't engage as much as I would like into it just because 
time is finite. <laughs> yes. I only have so much time of the day. I'm hoping that that organic engagement within the community will kind of just sustain itself to some degree where I, I still will definitely be engaged in it, but I know that it will fall off a little bit or at least seem like it does because of the volume. Um, so that's really why I wanted to focus on the type of engagement that I do. And, and as far as just the type of photographers that I want to encourage, I don't want to just be like a platform for people to self-promote themselves. Okay. I want to encourage the art, not just advertise photographers. Um, so that's really where I draw the focus from because I don't consider myself to be an awesome photographer. Um, and I know that others might have a lack of self-confidence as well. I want to make sure that I am pushing people to continue being creative even if they have self-doubt. Um, so that's why I make sure to keep all kinds of photographers included and encouraged and engaged because I want them to keep pushing forward and keep building the art. And it's been great seeing people that started back when I first started doing the threads that are still mm -hmm. doing it and being able to see them evolve as a photographer and do more thought out shots and edits and become more daring with what they're shooting. It's been awesome. Like I love the feeling of seeing people grow because of something I've pushed them to do. And it really comes from like my, um, just I've always wanted to educate. Like I've, I've always been someone that loves to learn mm -hmm. and kind of pass forward or pay forward what I've learned. Uh, because if it's something I'm passionate about, I know that other people might be too, but may lack the confidence to pursue it. Um, so that's really where that motivation comes from. I know that I am super long-winded, but no, that's all right. if, I'm, if I'm talking about something I'm passionate about, I will ramble. <laughs> well, I was going to say, you do a great job of not only promoting like your work, but like re like helping other people. It's not just like, oh, here's what I'm doing. Here's what I'm doing. Here's what I'm doing. It's like, Here's what right. I'm doing. Now I want to see what you guys are doing. And I think that is so cool. Right. And so uh, like a really valuable, uh, some, you know, for the community. Right. And then, I mean, and that, that comes from the same thing, though, because if, if people find my work interesting or my work inspiring, then it'll just encourage them to do the same and maybe try you know, new things. So I, I want to make sure that I am promoting not just the people within the community, but I want to make sure that it's coming from a place that, you know, at least someone knows what they're doing. So yeah. of course I'm going to show off, you know, my own work in the threads and, and at least show my evolution so that they can kind of feel like they're growing with me in a sense. You're like um, learning in public and it's, exactly. that's yeah, awesome. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. I kind of uh, I know I'm going through a journey and I've mentioned this on my website and I kind of want to take people along for the ride. Um, I mean, and hopefully they'll learn something along the way. So that's kind of where I've kind of built it. What I've built it around is learning and making sure that other people are learning along with me. One thing people ask me all the time, and I've been so far removed that it's hard for me to answer, but I think you'd be perfect for this. For new photographers who have taken pictures with the phone and they decide, you know what, I'm going to step up and buy a uh, Canon M50 or the Sony a7 II or something. And the pictures they're getting aren't as good as they were getting with their phone because they don't know what they do. And they kind of stop and they just put the camera on the side and like, I, it's too right. hard, it's yeah. done. What is it that you can, like, what can you tell the like, advice you can give someone like that to like help them kind of push through that? I always tell people the first month or two of any new camera, your picture is going to suck. <laughs> Even me, like I got a new, the Ricoh GR3X. It's a really cool camera. There's times I'm like, I don't know how to just bring the focus back to center. I can do right. it on every other camera real quick. But how yeah. do you, what advice would you give someone who's new to photography? Well, uh, for any new camera and any new device that you like try to pick up and learn, there's always going to be a learning curve that you have to get over. And there's always going to be that moment where you may get frustrated and be like, ah, oh, I don't understand it. I, I just, I just can't grasp how this works. And really it's just a matter of not giving up and just 
um, you know, just focusing on learning the device and knowing that um, the device itself is equipped to do what you want. You just have to learn how to get the result that you're desiring. With a cell phone, it's simple because it does all of that for you. It does all the, all mm -hmm. the pretty much does all the post-processing, but a lot of that's all like digital AI. And it may not be, you know, like your desired outcome, but with a camera, you're controlling every aspect of the photo that you're generating. You can, you know, you, you're in control of the aperture so you can affect the depth of field. You're in control of the shutter speed so you can reduce or add blur wherever you want to. You're in control of the focal length. So if you want to, you know, to zoom in on something, if you, you know, if you have a zoom lens and you can do that and mm -hmm. not lose what you do with a camera phone because we all know that the extra lenses that they put on those are terrible <laughs> wide angle photo telephoto if you try to zoom in or zoom out then it just drops considerably yep. um, but with a with an actual camera you don't lose anything because it's still the same sensor you're just you know changing the way that the lenses are positioned to get that zoom in or zoom out effect um, so just knowing that you can do more with the camera just because you have that finite control is really worth it in the end and much more rewarding once you do learn the device. And, you know, I, I wouldn't say I'm the master of my camera. I actually use the Canon N50, which you uh, just mentioned earlier. Um, and I wouldn't say I'm the master of it. I'm still learning uh, mm -hmm. the quicker ways to do things uh, within the system, but I'm at a point now where if I, you know, if I see that I don't have the proper focus or I see that I don't have quite the depth of field that I'm looking for, I know which setting to go into and change. Um, but it, yeah, it's just a learning curve. You will get over it. Uh, you just have to have that perseverance to know that you're learning a new device, even though you feel like you're doing awesome work in on a phone. It, it's still a new device and you do have more control over it, though. So I will say keep at it. You will be happy you did. What so you talk about the Canon M50? What lenses do you use right now? I've only got two lenses, okay. um, so I didn't get the kit lens like most people do, uh, just because when it comes to buying new gear and just buying anything that's super expensive, I'd like to do a whole lot of research. Mm -hmm. Yes, <laughs> um, so I probably spent like two or three months, if not more, just researching like entry level cameras. Uh, and versatile entry, entry level cameras. Mm -hmm. And I also wanted to do video at the time. So I wanted to find a camera that was um, cost efficient, but could also do decent photos as well as decent video recording. Um, and I just researched online. Uh, I did searches like best entry level camera for YouTube <laughs> or best entry level camera for photography. And the M50 was probably one of the ones that was recommended the most. Mm -hmm. um, a, another, a few other contenders were some of the entry level cameras from Sony, um, like the Sony FX series, I believe was on the list. But the Sony or the M50, as far as the crop sensor cameras was the most affordable mirrorless. So I wanted to make sure it was uh, like future- um, um, Future-proofed? Future-proof, there you go, thank you, um, <laughs> as well. So I wanted to at least future-proof it a little bit and not get something that was super old um, just because I'm, I'm an IT guy and I love new tech, uh, <laughs> but I wanted something that wasn't gonna break the bank. So yeah. I sat on the M50 and, and just, I mean, I, I love it. Um, I'm not like, I'm never gonna be someone that just sticks to one brand because that's what I've always used. I'm always open to new stuff and new technologies. So if I ever end up upgrading from that one, then I will be on board to try something new. Uh, but with that, I got the Sigma, two, two Sigma lenses, both primes. I got okay. the 16 millimeter and the 30 millimeter, just so that I would have a wide angle, uh, which was of course for YouTube, vlogging, yep. things like that. And yep. I actually use it more than the 30 millimeter now, even for photography. Um, and then the 30 millimeter, because it's a crop sensor, the yep. 30 millimeter is the closest to uh, 50 mil uh, yep. full frame equivalent uh, to get that, um, you know, the viewpoint that you see 
with the naked eye that, you know, of course, with the 50 mil and everyone harps that it's the closest thing you can get to like what you would see the yeah. that you would see with the naked eye. So I want to make sure I got one of those and, and really learned with something that was uh, relative to what I would normally see myself. But I actually I like used the, a 50 millimeter lens on a, I had like a Sony a 300 when I first started out, but I used that 50 millimeter lens for a year and a half. Like that was the first wow. thing I got. I just used it for a year and a half. I learned everything. I was like, if I get one lens, I'm going to learn on this one lens. And like when my kid was born, like that's the only lens I had and like everything. So yes, mm -hmm. I agree with you having like limited lenses, especially for people yeah. who are new. It's the oh, best yeah. way to learn your, oh. your gear. It really is. Cause I mean, when you don't have like a fancy lens with all the nice zoom features, um, and uh, you're limited with the point of view you have, yep. it makes you move and be yeah. creative with the way you're framing things. Mm -hmm. um, the reason why I've used my um, wide angle a bit more often is just because it allows me to get a bit more into the frame and it makes it so it's a little bit more forgiving if I can't quite get everything I want to in the image from where I am because I can get a little bit closer and um, you know, just kind of focus in on it if I need to, yep. but if I'm far away or maybe too close, I, I can't get all the image that I want with a, you know, the 30 millimeter. So I found that I was able to get more of what I wanted with the wide angle, um, than with the 30 millimeter. Um, I still like to use a 30 millimeter, um, from time to time, but I'd say the 16 probably stays on my camera most often. Awesome. So Thank you again for doing this. What, as a photography community, how can we support you? Like what, what is that we can do to help support you? Because you've done so much, for, again, like I said, for the Twitter community. So people who are going to be watching this, all the Twitter followers, what, how can we help, help support you? Well, um, I, I hate plugging myself most of the time, but I know it's needed, especially if I ever want to make money on it. <laughs> but um. I, I do have a Patreon. Um, I'm not as active on it as, I, as I'd like to. Um, and I do plan on making some changes to the different tiers in it. Um, right now it does offer um, some rewards because I do want to give back to any, you know, anyone that decides to support me. Okay. Um, I don't like just taking money from people. So I always want to make sure I'm adding value if you're you know, subscribing to something like that. Um, so with my Patreon, you do get things like um, you know, um, promo codes uh, for anything that I might be selling. Um, I do try to um, include, if I'm ever doing updates uh, as far as like behind the scenes mm -hmm. or keeping people up to date with things I've just got going on, I do like to release those to Patreon supporters first. Um, and with the higher tiers, I do have set up through Patreon um, things like uh, small prints and posters uh, that gets sent out to uh, patrons that uh, subscribe over uh, the several months. I think that the uh, first tier for prizes is for like three months oh, of, yeah. of a subscription. Then you get sent a, a print of some kind. Um, so I always want to make sure that I'm adding value, things like that. And of course, um, with that, I do also have prints. Um, I currently have the majority of my prints on Darkroom at oh, yeah. ericteichmiller.darkroom.tech. Eric um, but I do plan on selling prints on my website, ericteichmiller.com, in the near future. Um, I've already got some printed. Um, it's going to be a small batch print of okay. my Flowers and Monochrome series. Yeah, um, I saw one. that. I thought that was, I saw that and I was like, I, again, like, there's, there's an arrogance I see with some photographers where when I see you, they will show you something and you never see the world the same again. When I saw your monochrome flower pictures, I was like, I will never see the, like, I will now start thinking about editing <laughs> pictures differently after seeing that. I was so blown away by that. So that's yeah, really I mean, cool. Flowers of Monochrome was something that was born out of experimentation and also was born out of a happy accident. Um, uh, the first Flowers of Monochrome photo, which is the one that I had printed, um, was a photo that I just didn't know what to do with, but I knew I wanted to do something with it. And every uh, colorized edit that I tried just didn't have the right weight to it. Uh, the colors didn't mesh well. Um, the, there was a lot of distractions in the photo. 
But once I swapped it over to black and white, it just kind of came together. Um, and I've never been a, I love just plain black and white, but I'm also a huge fan of trying to make something look a little cinematic, add more yeah. drama. Yep. So I ended up with the uh, more monochromatic style edit um, after trying a few combinations and landed on what it is today. And just since then, I've noticed that every time I've applied a similar edit to um, different types of flowers, it kind of pulls you away from what people normally associate with flowers, which are the colors yeah. and um, all, all of you know those types of elements of it and brings you more toward the texture and the um, shape of the flower. So it makes you focus on different elements of it. And every time I apply similar edits to new flower photos, they all have a very similar weight to them. So I just decided to turn it into a series. And the print that's, that I'm making available first will be the first small batch print um, of the series, um, edition one. Um, I plan on doing small batch prints for all of the flowers and monochrome series. Um, okay. You know, as as I you know go forward and um, you know do more printing and um, start to make my photography a little bit more self-sustainable. Yep. Uh, right now, I don't really have enough disposable income just to go all in. <laughs> yes. I will pace myself. Um, <laughs> But, but yeah, it, I'm hoping that I can have that up. I'm aiming to do it before my birthday, um, which is this month. So I better hurry. Uh, <laughs> nice. But, but we'll see. It just depends on how other things in life pan out and where I can make the, make the time for it. But curious. I will make sure I will have links down in the description of this video with your Patreon, your website, your Twitter, anything else. Because again, if you're not following Eric on Twitter, you should. He's an amazing twitter space like for photographers again it's not about jpeg raw canon nikon anything like that it's about the photography thank you so much for doing this i really appreciate you doing this and appreciate you for everything like i said before everything you've done for the community uh, already on twitter which is awesome well i appreciate you too kwame i mean doing something like this was out of my comfort zone a little bit never been interviewed uh, especially about photography before so I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to come on, talk, and just give my points of view on things. And just generally, I appreciate what you're doing. Hopefully it continues and you can take, you know, take it to bigger and better things. So I look forward to how it evolves. So I thank, thank you. you. I, I appreciate that.